Hello and welcome to the Inside Stylist podcast where we talk all about interiors with interviews with interior stylists, writers and the big names in interiors from brands and PRs to artists and designers. I also catch up with industry experts in the know and get them to share all their knowledge and advice. There's so much to talk about. I'm your host, Emma Morton-Turner, an interior stylist and a writer with a ton of experience. I set up InsideStylist.com so I could share all that interiors love with you. So don't forget to head on over to the website for not only the show notes from today's episode, but for links to interior stylists, writers and assistants profiles and a ton of inspiration. But for now, enjoy the show. Today's guest's philosophy is that your home should tell your story It should make your heart sing when you open the front door. You need something old, something new, something black, something gold, and always some natural wood. She's a well-known interiors journalist, award-winning blogger, author, designer, and now online shop owner. She's a font of all things interior knowledge, and I have to resist the urge to talk all things grey hair every time I see her. She knows all the best products. I'm really excited to introduce to you today our guest, Kate Watson Smythe from Mad About the House. Hello, we are live. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kate, for joining us. Um, you've just explained that we're all at home. We've most of us, or a lot of us, have got kids. You've got builders as well, and your husband. So, I really appreciate you um, sparing the time to come and chat with us today. It is crazy times, but we're going to just put that to one side and just talk about positive, happy interiors things and um, what you've got going on, because you have so much going on. It's quite incredible. And I am going to be asking you about how you get all of that done um, in a minute. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, So I thought it'd be really good to start with how you got into interiors, like because you are an interiors blogger, you write books, but how did it get started? So I'm a journalist by trade and uh, I was a news reporter, which I I didn't love. I found very stressful and uh, I don't think I was particularly good at it. I wasn't very good at knocking on the doors. Um, And I always enjoyed the the writing, the construction of the sentences more. Um, And then when I had my elder son, who's now about to be 20, um, I went freelance because it's very difficult to be a news reporter. I mean, I I don't know if things have changed. Newspapers, there just aren't as many of them now, but they were, there were, there were a lot of men, um, a lot of women on the features section. There weren't so many women in news. And it was that thing where if you had childcare, you know, news happens when it happens and you can't say, could you let that bomb off a bit later? I've just got to get back for the nanny. Um, so you end up as a woman in a news reporting situation, you know, in the office all the time, rewriting the Reuters wires and the press association wires. And it's not particularly interesting. Um, so I went freelance and as is often the way of the things. I'd been at The Independent then for several years and uh, they were, I knew everybody there. I'd always wanted to write features and the woman who edited the property section at that time had a gap, needed it filling, said, could I just do that feature quickly? And I was like, oh, well, and I was in there and I clung on um, and I absolutely loved doing it. So I started writing the sort of property of the week that was for sale. Um, and in those days, you know, I mean, there was internet, but the, the estate agents weren't online. So the postman would turn up every week with a stack of brochures. I mean, he hated me. Um, and I would sit and look through these brochures and then have to call in the pictures and write about them. And it went from there. So I always say that I started writing about outside um, and then sort of worked my way inside. And then gradually I did more features which were about interior design. Um, and that was in the days when the independent had a weekly, I think it was 42 page pullout, all about property and interiors. And that was a lot to fill. So I, I just did that and I, I absolutely loved it. Um, so that was the start of how I got into it. And then fast forward sort of, you know, 12 years and newspapers were going downhill. My freelance career was, you know, taking a dive and and everybody had a blog and it was, you know, hello, what's your name? What's your blog? Um, and I didn't know what that really was and I didn't think it would be right for me. And then eventually I thought that it would work 
as an online CV, if nothing else. So that was the, the aim of it. And it was all done with Google, you know, Google, what is a blog? I'm like, Google, how do I write a blog? And, you know, it was, it was all very much done like that. And, and off it went. And obviously I never thought that we'd be where we are today. So it's been going for about eight years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when, you did the, when you did this, the, the independent, were you doing all of the 40 pay, 42 pages? Oh, God, no. Oh, no, I did, um, I did a feature, a couple of features a week. So I did the pick of the property market and then I would do one feature. It was very much a sort of, I mean, it's not dissimilar to what I do now, you know. Well, I remember actually one of the early pieces I wrote in 2009 was um, Dulux says the new colour is going to be grey. Ha, ha, ha. That's rubbish, isn't it? So obviously, I mean, you know, it wouldn't necessarily take myself, take me very seriously because I clearly don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but yes, so uh, that was one of the first pieces. And I remember writing a sort of slightly mocking piece going as if, um, you know, and there we were. But uh, so it was a sort of one how to or news piece a week. Because I was thinking you you write a lot because in the early days, am I right in thinking that you did a, a blog post every, like Monday to Friday, every day, Monday? To oh, no, I did Monday. I did seven days a week when I started. <laughs> well, because obviously I didn't know what I was doing and there weren't really very many interior blogs at that time. There was Swoonworthy, who's still going. There was Fabric of My Life, who's still going. Um, and, and the sort of big one that, that we all looked up to was Design Sponge, of course, which is now archived in the Smithsonian. And I didn't realise she had a team of people and she was posting, you know, three or four posts a day. And I thought, well, oh God, how am I supposed to do this? You know, tap, tap, tap. And then eventually I, I realised that she had a team of people. So I slowed it down to, because at right at the start, I had my own archive. So sometimes I did do two posts a day because I thought that's what you were supposed to do. But I was uploading stuff I'd already written from the independent. Um, also, it took me a while to realize you could schedule a post. So I was writing them all live to start with. Because I, had no, I mean, you know, if, an, if I can do this, Anyone can do it. Um, so then I slowed down and I came up with this how, idea. How did you do that then? Because you had two children by then, two young children by then. Well, they weren't that young. I mean, they were, they were, oh, I can't do the sums. They were born in 2000 and 2000, 2001, 2003. So, I mean, they were, I think, probably end of primary, beginning of secondary yeah. school by then. So I had, I did have a bit more time. Um, and also, you know, I think, never forget, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm a professional writer, I'm a journalist. I have written two deadlines every single day for nearly 30 years. That's what I do. Yeah. So, and I, you know, I never underestimate that of course it's easier for me than for many people um, because that's just the thing I know how to do. And in terms of, there, there was sort of training that turned out to be phenomenally useful. They used to be in the independent on Saturday a feature called the 50 best which we'll come back to um and the 50 best was it could be anything from sort of artisanal sausages to to lamps and you had to write sort of 50 to 70 words on each lamp that you found mm -hmm. And yeah. you weren't allowed to start every sentence with this, you know, this is a great lamp. You, you had to find different ways to start them. And, and I love doing those. And it turned out to be phenomenally good training for a blog or an Instagram caption, because you give me, you know, I mean, it should be my party game. You give me any object, I'll give you 50 words in about 30 seconds. Um, so there are various things which came together to mean that, Blogging is a is a media that that works for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is like I've blogged. I've also I started a cake blog in two thousand and eleven, um, and I know how long it takes. I I was taking my own images, but it was still the process of doing it is so time consuming. So, how do you like? Do you schedule what you're going to do? Like, do you plan a month ahead for your blog? You because you. How many times do you do that? It's three times a week now. It's four. It's four, four. times a week. And then on, on a Wednesday is, is my sort of ad break. So that's a sponsored post if I have one. Um, if I don't have one, there's no post. If I do have one, then you know that it's it's some form of collaboration. Hmm. Um, so I have one today, which is a, a charity post. I'm just going to plug it called Give Back January, uh, which is about recycling all your old electrics. 
Um, apparently there are enough discarded Christmas tree lights and it was 12th night last night to go all the way around every street in Britain. But wow. you can recycle them. So there you go. So that's today. My husband, I can say this now, I've not been allowed to say it for a long time because he's been a bit funny, but my husband's just changed jobs and he is working in scrap metal. And I can't ah. tell the conversations we've had about copper in wires and stuff. Yeah, it's absolutely. Crazy. And all the gold, I think all the gold yeah. and aluminium in computers and things. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so, so wasted. Say. So, so that's the, the, so I do, yes, four, four posts a week of sort of organic content, if you like. Um, they, I have a couple of fixed ones every week. So Monday and Friday, I do a sort of, you know, discussion on some beautiful rooms and why they work and, and hopefully providing inspiration. And then on Friday, I've stuck to that property thing. Um, I like it because I think we all like poking around other people's houses, of course, but also that is, I mean, yes, it's been tidied for the photos most of the time, um, but it's also real houses. You know, I think there's quite a difference between something a professional like you has styled for a shot in living, etc., cetera, um, as opposed to what your actual house looks like. And, you know, you had to deal with the fact that the walls are wonky or in the wrong place. So, so those are the kind of bookends of the week. And then the Tuesday and Thursday posts, they really vary from... Um, a how-to post or some interior design news or I mean it started off it was much more kind of shopping based and that has felt wrong over the pandemic um so it's it's evolved more into kind of how-to's and inspiration and new books and stuff you know whatever I can find sometimes it's easy sometimes I'm scratching <laughs> and do you sit down and plan sorry I'm really interested in how because you do produce a huge amount of content because I know how long it takes to write a blog post, get all the stuff ready to share it, all of that. Um, and it is very time consuming. Then you've got Instagram, then you've got writing books and, and all the other things you've got going on. So I'm just really interested in how you plan your time. So you've got four posts a week. You know what they're going to be. Do you sit down and do them over like two days and then they're ready for the rest of the week? Because now you know how to schedule. Yeah. But how do you? Do you it really time? varies. So I, I always sort of start by writing the month. And then I fill in well all the Monday posts and all the Friday posts. And then obviously there are podcast posts which are filled in. So there's two of those a month. And then there might be a couple of sponsored posts. So I fill in all the sort of fixed mm -hmm. points. And then I find probably that I've got anywhere between four and, and, and eight posts that I have to come up with the idea for. Um, so another one I've just started is a kind of news roundup called from On My Radar or My Radar to Your Radar. So, and then I sort of try and think about what they will be so that I've got a backup plan. It doesn't always turn out like that because someone something will then fall into my inbox that I quite like or I'll see something new. So it's a mix of, of plan and, and winging it. Mm -hmm. And then, it really varies on the post. I mean, so yesterday I was incredibly productive and I wrote the posts for the rest of the week yesterday. So now I'm feeling quite free. Um, but, you know, I might find another week that I'm sitting there at five o'clock the night before going. <laughs> um, I mean, it is slightly easier now we're all at home. You know, the, the juggle uh, for, for, for a very overused word um, was kind of worse last week last year the year before when we were going to meetings all the time because you think oh I'm just having a breakfast meeting but you know if you live in London it's 40 minutes to get there you have the meeting it's 40 minutes back you get back you want to rest and then that's your morning gone um so it's much from my point of view the lockdown is helpful because I have to get my 17 year old out of bed to do his zoom lessons um and then I'm kind of free from eight o'clock so I might well start work at eight o'clock um, and then, you know, I carry on till it's done. Equally, I've gotten to a habit of not really doing very much work on a Friday, but I will always work on a Sunday, mm. which I kind of don't love, but I quite like Fridays. Well, <laughs> so I love working at the weekends because there's no emails and I don't even think yes, that's there's, true. Tech, there's no phone calls, there's no emails and, I, yeah. and the kids are doing switch or whatever it is that they're doing it's just yeah. nice and quiet but I know what you mean it's almost like Friday might be your day for just completely switching off and mm -hmm. it's just your day for you isn't it and I think that's really important that people it's almost you just shift your weekend so yeah exactly that works for and you. you know as 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 journalists you know we always had to work Sundays or you had to work one Sunday and four because there's a paper on a Monday so you have mm -hmm. to work you know I mean it was the same thing at Christmas we always had to work on uh, Christmas Day because there was a paper on Boxing Day, but we never had to work on Christmas Eve. 
yeah. because there was never a paper on Christmas Day. So, you know, and, and we had to work bank holidays and things in rotation. So I don't have that very strong delineation of sort of nine to five, Monday to Friday, because my working life has never been like that. Yeah, yeah. It's good. It's that freedom. It's nice to have that freedom. And yeah. um, if I'm always encouraging people to start blogs, I think it's really important to have a, like you say, an online presence that is your your kind of living CV, your living portfolio. If someone wanted to start out now, what advice would you give them? I think the advice is probably the same advice I found for myself when I was starting, um, which is I, I think it's important actually to have a niche. I think when uh, that's one thing that has changed when when the internet sort of started you know when it was much smaller you could go out there and just be interiors or just write about dogs or or whatever your thing was and because the internet has now become so much bigger you need to specialize a bit more so it, it's it's better if you've got when it comes to interiors you know an aesthetic or a style or you know you write about DIY or you write about shopping or whatever your thing is so I think that helps because then that gives you some authority within that field um and the other thing that I think is very key is, and this this drum is banged all the time, it's consistency. And when I was first, you know, Googling, which is a blog, um, one of the things that came up again and again, and I totally get this, was people start blogs and they're really excited because it's new and they want to write something every day and they really don't care that just their mom and the dog are reading it. So they churn out all this stuff. And then between about three and six months, <laughs> they realize that actually it's a bit irritating that only their mom is reading it. Yeah. It's beginning to take up more time and, 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 you know, for what? And I remember reading this thing and it's called the sort of the, the winter of blogging discontent. And it, it starts between that period. And what happens is you think, ah, just, I won't, I won't do some, I haven't got anything for tomorrow. I won't do it. And you don't do it. And, and clearly nobody notices. No. So then you think, ah, I'll have another day off. And before you know where you are, two, three weeks, a month has gone by and your blog is dead because you haven't done it. So I had an idea, which I did for a couple of years, which was called 365 Objects of Design. And the idea was that I would, I counted them and I would have to write a post every single day to get me through that blogging winter of discontent and it was supposed to just be a little postcard here's a nice candle this is a bedspread so it was quite shopping based but it kept me going it built the audience and and people knew that you know I would be in their inbox at 7 a.m every day with a little kind of hi look at this and that's what kept me going and by the time I'd done that for a couple of years I went wrong in the second year and numbered it wrong and then I had to go back and redo it I was a nightmare so then I took the numbers off after that but I got in the house it by that stage and I think obviously no one has to do it as 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 much as I do I mean I have flooded the internet I'm, I'm aware of that um but I think you you know decide if your schedule allows you to post twice a week or once a week then show up and do it and I remember another sort of possibly name dropping anecdote my husband also worked at the independent he's a journalist and he was a deputy editor for many years and he interviewed once Alex James uh, from Blur about writing a column and uh and they were having lunch and he said to Alex you know how have Blur done it you know you're amazing and Alex James said to him um he said you know what I may not be the best bass player in the world but I showed up I showed up every day didn't matter if I was hungover or tired or didn't want to do it I showed up and I remember my husband coming back and saying Alex says that's the secret to his success and I thought do you know what that that works you just got to show up every day yeah. or however often you've said you will show up. Yeah. And wherever you're doing it, whether it's blogging or yeah. on socials or yeah. anywhere. Yeah. It's consistency. Consistency is key. Yeah. And so you mentioned scheduling. Someone asked me how you schedule your post, what tools you use. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, if you have a blog, you can plan when it goes live. So you can literally schedule it through that platform. What platform do you use for your blog? So I'm on WordPress. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I, I had a brief flirtation with Squarespace, but I am an old dog and the new tricks, are, well, they're not happening. Um, I can't do it. So, but yes, yeah, so it literally I just type it in and it says, there's a button which says publish and you can edit that button. And in there you put the time. So I just change that every time I write a blog post and you can go as far ahead as you want. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, that's I, very simple. It's part of the platform. I'm with WordPress as well and I love it. I think yeah. there's so many things you can do with it. And I love it that if you, you use one piece of content, so if we do a video here, if I transcribe that into a blog post later, I can then put that out six months time and it's all done in one go while it's all fresh yeah. in your mind. Not that I ever do that, but yeah. the fact that you can is really, yeah. really like The intent is there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. consistency about a bit ish um so talking of social media you are doing phenomenally well on instagram how do, but you are how do you think that kind of work because obviously you've got a name for yourself from um from mad about the house do you think one has fed the other i i do think that instagram is a well i mean you know i'm not going to be the first or the last to say it's it's a weird beast and i think we we hate it as much as we love it i was relatively late to instagram um i think it was probably about 5 years ago i'd been blogging for a while Twitter was my thing, uh, certainly to start with, because it's words. Um, and I, I enjoy, you know, I mean, you can now, your tweets can be much longer, but to start with, I enjoyed the challenge of the 140 characters and can you get a joke in there and can you make something witty and, oh, that word's too long, so can I find a shorter word? You know, it's a sort of thesaurus online, you know, that, I enjoyed that. Twitter's now changed and it's quite kind of can be very shouty and mean. And I do think there's a lot of things it's good for, but I, I am much less on there now. And I went to Instagram belatedly because, of course, the irony was I was so busy. I never left my house. So I thought, well, what, what am I going to take pictures of? Oh, I'll just have to take pictures of my house. Nobody will want to see those. Well, and there you go. Um, now, I still think whenever I went on it. So, uh, I mean, it must have been 2015 or something. I can't remember. Um it was much, much smaller, obviously. I would have been around for a while, but it hadn't taken off to, to, to where it has now. So A, it was much easier to get noticed. B, I absolutely stuck in my niche. You know, I did not do pictures of this, these are my shoes um, and this is what I'm having for lunch. I've never done lifestyle. Um, it was interiors, that's all you got. Um, so and, and to start with, they weren't all my pictures that very quickly they did become my pictures as that changed. So I think I very quickly got picked up. And I think the thing that kicked it off was Vogue magazine did their 10 best interior Instagrammers. There probably were barely 10 of us because, you know, most people were doing a much wider brief. Um, and I see people now who say, well, actually, I don't want to do just interiors. I want to widen it. Um, and I think perhaps it's changed again because you might be more likely to get noticed if you widen it now. And I am certainly much less on the platform now because I really can't take another picture of my house. Um, although we'll see when the, when the decorator's gone. Um, so I think it was easier for me to get noticed. And then it was something Basola Evans said to me, actually, who is the associate editor of Living, etc., and uh, I weirdly met her on the bus in about 2015 because she lives around the corner from me. And she came up to me and said, did you write a book called Shades of Grey? And I was like, oh, who are you? Um, and that so that was kind of quite exciting for both of us. And um, so we've become great mates and uh, because we live so close. And she said to me a few years ago, and this is also something I've never forgotten. She said the thing with Instagram was you could, people very quickly realized you could fake the numbers. You mm. could buy the followers and fake the numbers. So a lot of people did that. Um, and then, then it was realized that people were doing that. Um, and so the next thing was all about engagement. And then they realized you could fake the engagement because you, there are bots and so on and so forth. And I have to say, I've never done any of those things. But then what Basola said was, and I think this, she's right, you can't fake authority. If you know what you're talking about and if you show up in that field and talk about it consistently and knowledgeably, you will build authority and, and that can't be faked. So I think that has made a difference. You know, I've been doing it for quite a long time now. Um, and also, 
I think what happened again through the Vogue was it was that kind of Rolling Stone effect so that I, I think I end up on a lot of discovery pages for anybody who joins up and says I'm interested in interiors my account probably pops up so I'm I'm not sure now I mean my engagement fell off a cliff when I hit 100,000 followers I've never done a bot clear out because I have no technical ability at all and sort of don't know how to and I think that over the last year I've posted less and so my engagement is less so I I don't know I think there's a lot to be said for a small account with very high engagement mm -hmm. um and I think mine has just sort of gone on that on that path um because it keeps getting flagged up and you know I mean it's lovely I'm not I'm not complaining about it but I think and I don't know if this is one of the questions or if I'm going off tack that for me, I think a blog is in many ways more important, as you alluded at the beginning. You know, I, I've always said that Instagram is is kind of you date it. You haven't got any control over whether they're going to call you back. You know, you're chasing after it and going, please like me um, with your blog. You know that that's your marriage. That's your commitment. You you own that. You're involved in that. Um, and and you you have control over the search you know the thing about the Instagram and I say this to brands when they want to work they're like we just want an Instagram picture and I'm like that picture's gone in 24 hours you'll never be able to search it on the hashtag and if Instagram sees ad and decides it doesn't want to push it you're done you know I've done ads where they've shown them to 25,000 people now yes that's a lot of people but I've got 250,000 followers Instagram's not going to show it to them so you know, whereas with my blog, if I get the title right, I have a huge amount of traffic that just comes from Google searches on things I've written that that ping up. So I think blogging is, I don't think it ever really went away, but I think I think brands are having this massive romance with Instagram. And of course, there are hugely successful people on it. Um, but I think, you know, I'm constantly pleading with them, you know, come back to the blog because I think it's a better long-term place to be yeah it's almost like um you're if you have a blog you have a link back to that brand and it will continue to link yeah. back to that brand and every time someone does a google search they're much more likely to come up with the blog than they are with the instagram page. i did i mean i'd never had advertising on the blog and as i say i now tend to do these sort of longer term collaborative partnerships so i have a couple going on this year where i've you know, I'm going to partner with a brand for a year and write about them three or four times and maybe do an event. And, and that's I've always preferred a sort of deep dive into a brand. Um, but I remember someone ringing me up probably um, when the blog was a couple of years old, 2014 or something, and saying, you know, do, can I put an advertisement on your blog? And I said, no, you can't, because it just looks ugly. You know, you're writing about interior design and trying to make it beautiful. And there's a big advert going, B and Q, flashing over the top. And you think that's not sexy. Um, so I never, and, and adverts, you know, again, back then were very unsophisticated. They were sort of flashing lights. And I remember looking at Design Sponge and thinking, take that off, because there's this beautiful ribbon behind it and we can't see it. Um, but I remember him saying, well, you know, you should have an advert, he said, because you posted a link to a sofa bed that I sell. He said, and I've sold £40,000 worth of sofa beds over the last six months. And I was like, oh, that's nice. I've, I've had nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Not a diddly squat, but, you know, good for you, mate. So that was the point where you start to think, oh, I see how it worked mm -hmm. but that wouldn't have happened on Instagram he would you, you know he, he would have had sort of 20 minutes while the link was live or a day or something to to sell via that and then it would have it would have gone whereas I still get the odd you know click comes through yeah um, and and affiliate links is something I've only just got into and we can talk about that later mm -hmm. but um the other thing is sorry I'm going to move on from blogs in a minute but the other no, thing you don't is, have to um, <laughs> Instagram can shadow ban you, can take your account down at the blink of an eye and you are left with nothing. Whereas well, you, you don't own the copyright either, which is the thing people, yeah. you know, if Instagram shuts down tomorrow, that's, it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. But if you've got a blog and you've got a, new, uh, you know, sign up, so you've got all those emails, you can say, right, my Instagram's gone down, but here's the blog post on this, go look at it there. Yeah. You've still got access to people and people can still find you. So yeah. yes, blogging is all what it's all about. <laughs> Do you, um, do you plan, like, do you schedule your posts for Instagram? Do you do them? No, online? I don't know how. I <laughs> literally don't. 
Um, I mean, I'm a little bit more organized than I was in that. I remember again, when I started, uh, I would sort of get up at, you know, seven o'clock in the morning and, and take a picture and post it. And then in, in, no, in November, when it wasn't light, you'd be going, oh, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to post today because I haven't got any light. Um, I will now, you know, if I've taken a picture, I'll think, oh, I'll post that tomorrow. And I might, will probably write the caption and do the hashtag, hashtag so boring, um, do the hashtags in the caption the night before. Um, and then I am literally going, well, of course I'll be awake at seven o'clock to post that. And then, you know, it's pandemic. And if the kids aren't at school, I've missed it. I wake up at 8.30, I go, oh, oh well, I won't post that today then. Cause I've met, that was my window. Um, that tomorrow. So, so yes, I'll do it tomorrow. I, um, yes, I'm not very good at the scheduling and the planning. Probably should be better. Probably make my life easier, but yeah. I'm really, I'm really surprised because you do, well, you, you're very organized and you do kind of put things out at like seven o'clock every morning. It does. Well, I've always had that window because my, when my son, uh, who's 17 was going to school, he left the house at 7.30. So I would get up at 6.30, make him breakfast because otherwise he's not getting up. And then, so from about quarter to seven, till seven there would just be a sort of 15 minute window before anybody else appeared when I could drink my coffee and I think well I'll post then um and it was done and out of the way and then I could go and get dressed and, and move on with the day and of course that's now gone because you know he's getting up later and his school is on zoom and you know yeah it's like exercise isn't it I did so much exercise during the first lockdown and now it's all changed and it's not quite, I'm trying to get back into that. So especially after- I went the other way. I spent lockdown lying under a bottle of Campari doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Literally didn't move. Um, and, and this one, we're, we are on it now. We've, the booze has gone, the bike's arrived. We are trying to get on it now. Yes. <laughs> um, let's talk about design for diversity. Yep. The amount of times I've said divine for diversity, I've got it. Divine is good. <laughs> divine for diversity. Now, obviously, I know what this is. I have got it on um, Inside Stylist, of course. But um, do you want to just briefly explain what it is for anyone who hasn't come across it? I'm sure they have. But just anyone listening on the podcast when it puts out, I put it out as a podcast. So obviously, this began after the Black Lives Matter movement and the murder of George, Law George Lloyd. Oh. And... Um, Sophie Robinson, who I host my podcast with, yes. The Great Indoors, and I were, were discussing, you know, what we should do uh, because we were seeing people calling out the interiors uh, sector mm -hmm. um, for not commenting and not saying anything. And there was a lot of reaction of people going, well, I, you know, this is in America. This is, you know, this we write about cushions. And what we suddenly realised that, that this was a pivotal moment where we could all get on board. And it was one of those sort of earth changing moments when actually everybody suddenly woke up and realized about things being really unfair and, and sort of years of discrimination. And so we thought we would start uh, with a podcast on the subject mm -hmm. and we, very aware that you know two white middle class extremely privileged women so we thought the way to do it would be to just invite people onto the podcast people of color from from that sector mostly to talk about their experiences and so we asked them to record themselves some of them we spoke on the phone and we read out their statements um and um, and it was it was heartbreaking, you know, people talking about turning up for a job and uh, being turned away or their CVs not being looked at. Um, and so we just kind of put that out almost really without any other words. It was just like, this is what we've heard. And then as a result of that, I was chatting to Rukmini Patel, who'd come on the podcast and had said, you know, she's a, a young, very talented interior designer, that she had thought about changing her name or at least changing the name of her business from Rukmini Patel Interiors, because she felt she was only getting Indian clients and people weren't even looking at her style. They were just going, oh, she's called Patel, we'll hire her, or, oh, she's called Patel, we won't hire her. You know, I mean, it was it was sort of very uh, clearly defined. And, and I, you know, started chatting to her, I said very strongly, you can't change your name. You know, I mean, uh, this is 
does not relate in any way, but you know, my name is Watson Smythe. As a child in the 70s with a double barreled name with a hyphen, my first name is Charlotte. You turn up on a list with the name Charlotte Watson Smythe, everybody thinks you've got a string of horses in a Rolls Royce and they hate you. You know, so obviously uh, my experience is, is yeah. Uh, so my experience is very different, but I have had to learn to grow into my name and to accept my name. So Rukmini and I started chatting and I said, you know, the problem is that we felt following the reaction from the podcast that there was a, a huge amount of, of willingness from what is largely a very white privileged community to, to be more diverse, to, to, to be more helpful, but they didn't know what to do and how to do it. And the black community was feeling shut out and, you know, stories of, I went to the Ideal Home Show and everybody there was white. So how can I possibly go into interior design? I don't see anybody who looks like me. Yeah. So there were these two sort of sides is, is the wrong word, but didn't know how to talk to each other. And there was a certain amount of willingness. So Rukmini and I just kind of came up with the idea that it that, that maybe it was something as simple as a sticker, you know, a sign to say, we, we are open to being talked to. Um, and I know there was a, a, a lot of feeling among the black community that the white community had to reach out. And it wasn't about saying, I'm opening the door, you've got to walk through it. It was about saying, I'm opening the door and I'm sticking my hand out and I'm gonna grab you in. And I'd also spoken to someone who runs a PR company who had thought that, that she was very diverse and inclusive in her approach. Um, she, she said she remembered advertising a job and only white people applied for the job. And she was like, what, what is the matter? What's going on? And then of course she looked around her office and thought, oh, maybe we are a bit white. So she rather brilliantly went to the local uh, university and college and she went into the media department and she said this is me I run a PR company I want you 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 and you to come and apply for a job you know let's see why aren't you approaching me so she went out and sort of grabbed them and, and brought them in and implied them and, and, and employed one of them I think possibly two um, and took a very proactive approach to it so we came up with the idea that this sticker would would be the sort of representation of a of a pledge if you like which was that you know you would make your channels your website your blog all your social media more inclusive and and more diverse you know we all saw around that time last May that people were being called out because all their case studies you know, were, were with white people. And I remember speaking to a lighting company and they said, well, we just sell lampshades, you know, how can we be more diverse? But then they looked at where they had, you know, beautiful houses they'd featured and they belonged to white people. So they were like, oh, okay. So there was a sort of light bulb moment for a lot of people who thought, a lot of white people who thought, this doesn't affect me. I know I, I feel I'm doing the right thing in my private life, but my websites are not reflecting that. So there was that pledge that you would be more diverse and inclusive on your visible presence. Um, and then, you know, provide more opportunities that you would, you know, we, we said very much, we weren't getting involved in sort of tokenism or positive discrimination, but saying, you know, we, we really want you to come and be interviewed for this job. We will try and look for more diverse candidates mm -hmm. to bring through the interview process. We're going to take the best person, but we want to widen it. And speaking to someone uh, who works in graphic design, who said that, you know, he, he'd only ever managed to bring one black designer into his studio. Um, and so he felt that by having the sticker, other young black designers might see that and go, I'm gonna knock on that door. And again, uh, to, to go back to Basola from Living, etc. She said that when she applied for jobs um, in the 80s and 90s, The Guardian, we all used to get our media jobs from The Guardian newspaper. And they would say, you know, people of color, welcome to apply. And, and she would take that as a sign of encouragement. And I spoke to someone else who said, why would you put that? Surely it's obvious, she said looking around her business, which was full of white people. So it, it was it was bringing back that notion of saying, you know, you, you can talk to us, we are open. 
Um, and that, that again, your events, you know, the, we called it accessibility, your events would be more diverse. You know, I've been on panels where I have been the only white person. I've been on panels where I've said, are you going to invite an Asian person or a woman of color or a black person? They go, yeah, yeah, no, we're having them. And then you turn up and they're not there. And you're like, well, I asked you. And they'd be like, oh yeah, she couldn't come, she's on holiday. It's like, Jeez, well, only one. It's someone else, <laughs> or at least tell me because I, wish to be on something that's more representative so this pledge is uh, is about you making the effort to do that and you know there it, it, it we've had i think 250 brands have signed up to it there has of course been um some talk that it might be tokenistic we can't regulate it you know we're two tiny people but i mean i think if you're putting that sticker on your website and publicly saying this is my position then you you're you can be called out if you're not doing it and you know we've had so one of the first brands that signed up, signed up was heels mm -hmm. um they have it on their website we're partnering with them to do some talks they've apparently started a program of diversity training within the whole store uh with baron ball have signed up and that's global so they took them a little bit longer because they had to work out what their procedures were going to be and then smaller companies rocket st george dowsing and Renault, pookie lighting all signed up and they've all put things on their websites you know with further information dowsing and reynolds is based in leeds if you want to go to this youth club in leeds or there's this program and so you know, people have taken it and expanded it. I think Black Pop, who are a textile company near Derby, have now sponsored a student at the local university um, and they're mentoring her. And uh, it is a her, might be, might be a him next year. Um, and the idea is that they will mentor her throughout the year and then she will produce a design for them, which they will then put into production. And, you know, maybe she'll have a job there or she will do. So so it's an, an monkey puzzle. I'll stop after this one. Monkey puzzle tree, um, again, based near Leeds. She was really struggling to find designers of colour and she kept putting out appeals and no one came forward. And she's used the sticker and now she has found some designers, she found a great young designer who she's working with. So it was just about. It was a, it was a, it was a conversation opener is what we hoped for it to be. We weren't saying we would change the world or we could change anything, but it was about saying, "Look at me, I I am open. I want a conversation. I want to learn. Teach me." So that was that was that idea. It's fabulous. It's phenomenal, and I think it just needed someone who has your standing to to stand up and kind of almost help other people get involved it was very and at, you, at the time when I spoke to you I spoke to Sophie I spoke to a lot of other stylists and it was a time where it was like I want to do something I don't know what to do people were paralyzed with fear and also yeah. about doing the wrong thing you know and yeah. it was it was quite frightening and you know it was mentioned obviously Rukmanian Rukmini is Indian um and I'm white and someone said you know well there's no black person there's two of you and you haven't got anyone from the black community and it would you know we we spoke to lots of people of, of different backgrounds and ethnicities but there was also that notion of we just kind of had that idea on a Saturday afternoon and if we'd gone out and said do you want to do it with us because you're black well wouldn't that be against everything we'd kind of said so so that that was the the way it came about and that that was the way it was and I think you're um, always going to get criticism whatever you do you can't you yeah. kind of, you're doing something from from the heart basically you have it and it's, it's growing as I say we yes we've got a project ongoing we're just putting it together with the Lord Mayor's Fund for London um which is they run a series they do careers advice but also we're going to do a series of webinars um aimed at uh school kids I think 15 or 16 who are beginning to make those choices mm. um and so again it comes back to that well I can't get into styling or interior design or media because they're very white industries so we're we've partnered with them to work on this series of webinars which will be coming up in the next few months um where you know we can say look at these people who, who've made it in this industry and be inspired by them so it's it's growing into something else which which is fantastic yeah um i'm gonna just do a little shameless plug myself here now so i think i talked to you at the time i really wanted to set up a mentoring 
thing for I don't know what's called scheme yes yeah. and whatever for people to get into styling because I think a lot of um like Rook Mini is a designer not a stylist so it's kind of a really good to um bring people in so I am going to be launching that to get people Fantastic. specifically into styling so I will talk to you if there's anything we can do together for that yeah. let's move on otherwise we're not going to have time to talk about two biggies that you've got going on <laughs> design story tell us about that design story is going to be my shop it's going to be I suppose a bit like the commercial arm of the blog maybe um it came out of, I mean, I actually had the idea about a year ago um, and it was supposed to launch about, uh, you know, last March and then hmm, pandemic. Um, so the idea is, again, as I say, I never had on the blog affiliate links and I never had advertising and I've never done it on Instagram and I keep meaning to, but I literally don't know how to set it up on Instagram. I am so technically clueless. Um, so, I, so I never did it and I thought you know, that it would be one way we're all having to think in new ways as freelancers. I'm guessing nearly everyone listening to this will be freelance. You know, we've had to kind of pivot and find new ways to make things work. Um, so there was that notion of, of perhaps this would be a good way to, to run a shop. But what I felt was there's a, there's a lot of affiliate link schemes about, and there's a lot of people doing it on Instagram. And there's that element of you, you spend three stories saying, and this is an affiliate link and I'm apologizing for that because it might make, you know, a tiny one or 2% if you buy it in the next 20 minutes and anyhow, here you go. And it feels, so that feels very apologetic. And I wasn't sure there was anything wrong with that. You're saying, you know, bringing a, a, a new market to this, merchant that might be a good thing to do um and also when it's done on blogs it tends to be a sort of scrappy little column going oh here are the things that I've written about that I've remembered to upload and there's a bit of face cream and a pair of shoes and here's a nice cushion and and it didn't feel organized and I like things to be organized so I just thought that what with that and so the, the pandemic obviously slightly changed thinking in that suddenly we've all got better at buying online. I mean, I know millennials are really good at buying online, but there are a lot of people of, of my age and older who, you know, they do want to try before they buy or they want to see it. And, and you know, so they've, but again, they've also had to change because we can't necessarily get to the shops. The high street is, is decimated. So there was, there came about a, a, a comfort at buying online and returns are getting better. So that helped. But by the same token, there's so much, mm. so much stuff. And, you know, I mean, I remember years ago when I used to consult on interiors um, and, and the idea at the time was you would sort of shop your Pinterest board, which when Pinterest first started, if you remember, you couldn't do that. You'd mm. see these nice pictures and didn't know where it came from. So I started off for a while just saying, well, you show me your favorite pins and I'll tell you where you can buy the equivalents. You know, it was that simple. Um, and obviously Pinterest then caught up with me. Obviously, with <laughs> um, and, and now they do that. So that that wasn't needed. But you know, you you go on to Lara Doot, which is a great affordable website for a cushion and they are particularly good I'm sure you all know at, at sort of textiles and bedding and rugs and throws and you know there's 47 pages of cushions and you just want to end yourself before you get to page 23 but you don't because what if the good one's on page 29 <laughs> and you're never gonna know and so and and that I was just was sort of desperately you know and also you put in the filters and you go oh, I, you know I want a blue cushion and then actually what you don't realize is that if you'd been in a real shop and you'd walk fast a fabulous pink one in the entrance you'd go oh actually the pink would work with the blue I want that one so you so filters I feel aside from being glitchy are just annoying because you can you can miss things that you didn't know you wanted and you know we only have to watch location location with Phil and Kirsty and they come up and their their clients go oh I want a house that looks like this this and this and they don't buy them the ones they show them and then you cut to them three months later you know and the the, the instead of wanting a converted barn in the country they've bought a modernist loft in the middle of a city and you're like so that's what filters does for you so the idea would came back to my 50 best history that I will go through and curate and edit and find you the 50 best lights for your sitting room and 
the 50 best beds. And I'm not going to get to 50 best beds, but the idea is that there will be a maximum. There will never be more than 50 of an item. And there will be 10 on the page. That's five pages. You've only got to go through five pages. And the idea is that if you think you want a table lamp and you're looking at table lamps, but you don't see it, you could actually, maybe a floor lamp would work or a pendant light hung low in a corner, you know, so you, you don't need to be stressed about how much stuff you're going to look through. And I would like to think that I've earned the right after doing this writing for so long to, to have an idea of, of editing that for you. Yeah. And the other sort of point of difference, again, comes back to this sort of 75 words of information. I'm going to tell you, so I'm going to show you these 50 best lamps and I'm going to say, look, this is great in a bedroom because it's got a fabric lampshade. I'm literally making it up now because I'm looking at a lampshade. Um, but you know, you could change the lampshade, totally change the look of the lamp, and then it could go in your sitting room. Or actually, you know, why have you tried putting a table lamp in a kitchen, which is quite an unexpected idea, so that there will be advice with each piece as to why you might want it. You know, I always think console tables are great because you can have them, you can use it as a desk when you first start because it doesn't take up much space. It's kind of laptop width. But then if you move to a bigger house, you could have it in a hall. I dream of a hall wide enough for a table. Um, but, you know, so you put it that in a hall, but that same piece then in another house might go behind the sofa with lamps on it. So it's about hopefully guiding people and explaining why they might want to buy the thing and why it might work for them so it's arranged room by room so you go into the office and there you will find desks and task lamps for the two sort of specific things and office storage but you know your office might not be in an office it might be in the corner of your bedroom so actually you might want to go into the bedroom to look at bedroom furniture or there will be a sort of complete collection place where you can look at all the lights and again knowing that you've only ever got to do five pages and it will be explained so that's the idea I need to maybe shorten my pitch <laughs> It's um, it's edited choice. You're editing people's choice to the best, yeah. basically. Um, when does it launch? A 16th of January. Oh, that's next week. Oh God, don't. Well, we've got a piece in Telegraph magazines coming out to talk about it, and then a piece in the Standard. So it's getting some some press. Yeah. So I am now frantically sort of going through and going. Well, I've got 35 of those lights, but that's good because, you know, I want to have the movement. I don't want to put 50 up of everything when we open and then discover that either I've missed something or somebody wants to be involved and I've got to knock them out, knock out something else. Yeah. So, you know, there will be 50s in places. So there'll be 50 great things for bathrooms, 50 great things for kids. But again, that will include some rugs that are quite kid orientated. But if you don't want a round rug with, with teepees on it, go and have a look at the full rug collection. So you can move around my house and story with an E. So it's the stories of a house. Yes, so yes what's that's, your that's story? Very, very yeah. clever, very clever. I'm very <laughs> excited for that, very excited. I'm just gonna shop in one place from now on. Oh, that um, would be good. <laughs> I, I've got two more questions. One is, you got a new book coming out. I've got a new I book. I pre-ordered it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it so is, I mean, it, you know, it is essentially a book of blank pages. Um, not quite. It's uh, this is why I'm so in awe of how much content you put out, because you've built a shop. You've written a book. You wrote the book in lockdown, didn't you? Is it the first yeah. lockdown? Yeah, I just knocked a book out during lockdown. Well, as I say, it is a, it is a, it is a journal. It's a book of blank pages. I mean, there is content, but yeah, um, still had yeah, to I'm just... But I saw you were going to ask me this question, actually. And I did think, I think in many ways, that's when I'm stressed, I take on too much. And I do go into to work mode. And I think it's really helped me mm. because, because I've just filled the time with work. And that, that has been, for me, a godsend and kept me sane. And, you know, I have, I fantasise about lying on the sofa with a book and reading. And I, I did quite a lot of that over the last couple of weeks. But... You know, for, I, I just have to keep busy because if we can't go out, you know, it's either that or I'm going to shop too much and, you know, can't even wear my shoes anymore. So, you know, <laughs> there's no point. Uh, might as well buy cushions. Um, but yes, yeah, so the book is, it's Mad About the House, The Planner. 
Your Home, Your Story, and the, the first two books in the series both had a, an introductory chapter called Your Home, Your Story, the point being that, you know, you, you this your home should tell the story of the people who live there. So that felt like the right title. Um, but I I don't know about you, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one, you know, when you move into a new house or you, a new room or, you know, the rent share or something, you have a notebook and you make a list of what you want to do and where you want to shop. And then you try to draw floor plans and then you discover a bit of graph paper. So you, do, you draw a better floor plan and then then you lose it um, and you lose the book and all the bits of paper fall out and you want to keep your budget together. So you start off really well keeping your receipts. I mean, freelance is probably better at that than most. But and then, you know, you forget because something was actually so expensive. You just don't want to look at that receipt again. Um, I still have a pair of boots like that I bought in New York about 12 years ago. And I can't I, I sort of don't know how much they cost <laughs> to put them on the credit card. And I never looked. Um, but so so the, the, you end up with this kind of mess of bits of paper and you lose track as well. So it's very important to to have that journal idea um, within the book. So this is, this is a planner. There is graph paper for you to draw your floor plans. There is blank lined paper for you to make notes. There are checklists for you to, you know, room by room. Uh, what creates the, what do you, elements do you always need in a bathroom, in a bedroom, in an office? Um, there's a little bit of chit chat about things to consider. Um, and then there's a space to write your budget. There's an address book where you can put your favorite websites and some of mine. You can write down the trades, you know, that this is the number of the plumber. So you've always got it to hand. Yeah, um, right. and, and a space to write down the paint you used and actually how much did you use and did you like it and also crucially because I did this with this room I'm in now and you probably can't tell it's thread needle by Mylands it's a very pale pink we tested about 20 pinks to find the right one and and then I was doing my office and I was thinking that might work in a pink and I couldn't remember any of the 20 I'd previously tested so then I was like Ugh! now I can't remember what was wrong and what was right so you know there's a space to have all that plus the idea which came out of the second book about the six questions you must always ask who yeah. what when where how and why you know who am I doing this room for and it's fine that if in your fantasy you're doing your bedroom for a romantic lady who's going to swan about and you know answer emails at nine o'clock every morning you know and the reality is you've got to get to work the baby's been sick on the bed and you know and you've lost the dog so who does this room really need to cater for so there is space for those questions for you to write down, you know, who's it for, what are they doing, when are they doing it? And that helps you decide, you know, what kind of sofa you need, how big your table needs to be, and then you can draw a floor plan. And the other thing that there's a sort of prescribed space for is what I've called love, lust, loathe, which is my version of kiss, marry, kill, um, where it, you write down, you know, what you love about the house or that particular room, you know? And, and so for me, there's a, in my sitting room, there's a space where the sun comes through at three o'clock on a winter's afternoon and hits the sofa. And that's a lovely sort of afternoon spot. So actually make a note of that so that you don't put a cupboard there or, or, or knock out that nice little thing, you know? So that's what you love. What you lust after would be, you know, where do you want to shop from? You know, do you want to shop from only small eco businesses or actually do you need that big thing from China in a hurry you know so it's a sort of list of aspirations but also where you want and what you want to achieve um, and also you know it's good to have a thing of it's as important to know what you hate as what you love so write down the things you loathe partly as a reminder that you're going to get rid of them and partly as a reminder when they've gone just how awful they were so it's it's a kind of bullet journal mm, and, uh, like cleansing your brain from yeah exactly that. but then you have it all there because yeah. we do forget and um, you know like, when you have a really good carpenter or plumber you'll have an email or a text message you won't have written it down unless you keep it in your phone or maybe you change your phone and you lose numbers and stuff yeah. you have paint like paint colors and names and phone numbers and things like that in a book on your bookshelf it's genius well and also i i you know i mean i know we've we've got a much more sort of digital life now but you know i might see something on instagram i like so i might open it might on the shop on my computer and keep that tab open and yeah. then you know inevitably the computer crashes or you reboot or you just think you know what i'm not going to shop from there now it's gone and it's gone yeah so 
you know, if you have a book where you can go, here's a list actually of great shops mm -hmm. I've spotted that might be useful. As you say, I think sometimes pen and paper, and we've we've tried really hard to make it beautiful. I should have brought one to show. You. I've only got one copy, and it's downstairs. I'm, I'm sure thinking. it's. This is how this is how disorganized I am. It's um, it has gold foil around the edges. Okay. Yeah, and it's got two ribbons, so you can mark. You know, that was a bit of a publishing coup, actually, to get two ribbons. They're very funny about ribbons. Ribbons are very expensive, apparently. But yeah, it's got two, and it's 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 not black and white because it's a kind of chocolate brown. But the idea is that it's it's monochrome because it's your story, so you could color color it in if you wanted to. I mean, yeah, that's that's the idea. So very exciting. That's coming out in March, fourth of March the book yeah fourth of march yeah so mm -hmm. not long really um my last question is always what's next but i kind of think you've kind of explained everything that's going on have you got more in the pipeline on top of all of the have i got more in the pipeline um <sighs> yes What's so next? i'm having a chat with i mean i don't know I, I quite like a lie down i mean i think i've got the shop i'm keeping the blog going certainly next year the blog will be 10 years old uh, 2012, wow. 2022. So, you know, maybe things will change and the shop will become, you know, more of a, a, a thing because it's almost going to be like a micro blog with each shop. Mm. And I'm hoping to do a weekly newsletter, which you can subscribe to. So, um, yeah. so I think th those are my two nexts for the moment. I haven't got another one after I think that's that. That's probably enough. <laughs> <laughs> Kate, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I'm so, you've got, I'm just, I'm very inspired. I think people have taken a lot of value from everything you've said now and they're all going to go off and be really consistent in everything. <laughs> yes, consistent. That's all you need to do. Show up and be consistent. Yes. That's all you need to know from the last hour. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Kate. I really appreciate your time. It's been lovely to chat with you. I could chat and with you today. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Inside Stylist podcast. You can find all the details from today's episode over in the show notes on InsideStylist.com. If you enjoyed the show, I'd love it if you would head on over to iTunes and rate and review it. It's the best way to help other people find the show and I'd really appreciate it. Until next time, bye for now.